The second part and the final section in this course deals with intellectual property law. And this applies domestically and internationally. And this is one that is very, very, very important in today's world. It's become so important because many of the things that we buy today are intangible services. And intellectual property is very much an intangible item. It is not physical. It is someone's idea, someone's design, someone's invention. It is not a something that you can look at and say, this is something that we can clearly see was made by you. So intellectual property law has become critically important, particularly in the realm of the internet. And as I say, this is chapter 26. So intellectual property is really a subcategory of intangible personal property referred to as ideas, information, and creative works. Intangible personal property refers to the rights or the claims that one person has that has value or can be enforced in the courts, such as the right to collect a debt. These rights are often referred to as chose in action or right to sue. So right off the bat, you're running into some challenges in the court because again, it is personal property in the form of ideas, information, and creative works. These are often very difficult to point to and say, that is mine, okay? So, and when you are granted that intellectual property right, the job of the court is to ensure those rights are protected. And it's a very difficult challenge for the court because it is just ideas and information. It's very hard to define who came up with it. So intellectual property law attempts to balance the protection of the product of a person's mental effort on the one side and the free flow of new and innovative ideas that stimulate the advancement of commercial environment on the other. So there's a little bit of a paradox going on thing is, our world develops and our whole economy develops really on people coming up with new ideas on how to do things that make us more productive. So you can imagine years ago, let's, let's, I'll just take something, a very tangible thing that people can, can relate to. Years ago, in order to put paint on a wall, Okay, in order to put paint on a wall, you used to have to use a paintbrush, and it took an extreme amount of time and energy to paint. Brushing is very, very slow. It works, and you can do it, but it takes a lot of time. A Canadian inventor came up with the idea of a roller, and this roller would have bristles on it that would hold paint, and you could roll it onto the wall. And it sped up the painting process by about a factor of five times. And it did a very good job. True, you still need brushes, but the paint roller brought tremendous efficiency to painting. Now, the thing is that in our society, we'd like the idea of efficiency because we can do more with less. It takes less time to paint a wall. You can paint more walls. Cost of painting the wall goes down, human effort is reduced. A lot of positives that contribute to the overall wealth of our nation and overall wealth of our economy. So people are gonna say, yeah, I want one of those. That's a good idea. Well, at the same time, if we flip around and we say, okay, let's look at the individual who came up with the idea to paint roller. He or she would certainly want to benefit from their invention. They want to you know, make sure that they're rewarded for their innovation. 
And in order to reward them for your innovation, you got to limit the number of people who have access to that paint roller or make sure that those people who have access to the paint roller pay the person who came up with the idea. So it's a bit of a bit of a double-edged sword. We want it to be uh, used and put into place because it encourages efficiencies and it makes our society more efficient and adds value. Well, at the same time, we want to ensure that the person who came up with the idea makes the most on it. So we don't want everybody using it. So we're at this kind of a, a seesaw between free flow of ideas and compensating innovation. So government and the law has really been wrestling with this idea for many, many years. And legislation has been developed and legal precedent has been developed around this idea of intellectual property, the ideas. So, you know, the paint roller is really a tangible embodiment of the idea. What we're focused on is the idea. Okay. So most legislation protecting intellectual property is federal while copyright and patent legislation being exclusively granted by the federal government. So the federal government has really taken the, the reins on this. If you look at the Constitution, 1867, it grants the federal government authority to do this. And this is good because, as you're well aware, the paint roller is used in every single province. So it's not as if we need different legislation in each province. So the very there are really three major types of uh, three broad categories of intellectual property out there. There's, as I say, ideas, um, which encompasses works of art and things like that. And there's physical products that are developed, such as paint rollers. And there's images or logos, these sorts of things, industrial design, we'll call it. So there's a lot of permutations on intellectual property. The very first one we want to deal with is the one that is probably most common, and that is the concept of specific protections for works that are written down. Copyright. The Copyright Act was first brought into place in Canada in 1928 and has been amended lots of times since then, but the fact of the matter is it has a hundred year, almost a hundred year history in Canada. And effectively what the copyright does is specifically protects computer software and also protects original works published on the internet. It extends to the authors of written work or artist in the case of something that is drawn or whatever, it extends protection from the end of the calendar year in which they die for 50 years past that date. So essentially what copyright does is it makes sure that the author of a work continues to own the rights to that work for up to 50 years after their death. So their estate will really benefit from it. So if you're someone like Drake and you pin a song, that song is protected by copyright. And it will remain protected by copyright until 50 years after the death of Drake. There's no formal registration necessary with copyright. The moment you write something, if you are listening to me now and scribbling on a pad of paper, and that scribble that you have there, that is automatically copyright, meaning it is yours and it is protected as yours for 50 years past the period of your death. There's no need to register it. Now, the question then becomes, well, if I don't register it, who's gonna know that I did it? And that is the fundamental problem, isn't it? You, it's one thing to say that there's no need to register it, but how can you prove it's yours? 
So you can register a copyright, but you don't have to. But the fact of the matter is, fundamentally with copyright, it is your job to protect your copyright and materials. It's not the government's job. So that scribble that you wrote down, if I took it and copied it and sold it for money, I, uh, you would have to come after me to stop me from doing that. The government wouldn't be the ones to come after you. So really, copyright is for the beholder of the copyright to ensure that the copyright is kept. So the owner of the copyright controls the reproduction of the work during the period after which the work becomes part of what we call public domain. <coughs> You'll notice that in church, a lot of the hymns are very, very, very old. And the reason they're very, very old is because they are all in the public domain. They're outside of the 50-year period of the fact of the, the, author's, uh, the author's death. And this kind of saves the copyright issue in terms of churches or performances. And this is the thing, you know, you say, well, I can sing a song by Bob Dylan. Bob is very much alive. Am I breaking copyright? Uh, in the strict sense, if you're making money on it, you are. You know, it, it is. It is his song. You're making money on it. You're making money off his work. So theoretically, he should be entitled to a certain portion of your work. Now, the question is, is Bob Dylan going to come after me for that? Probably not. Now, if I introduced a song and it became wildly popular and I made a lot of money on it, Bob Dylan will probably be after me on it. And Bob would do one of two things. He could either cease and desist, which would stop me from doing it, so the sign gets erased, more or less, or he would collect royalties from it, which is the more likely case. The Copyright Act gives the owner of the copyright a monopoly, so effectively it is a monopoly over the use of the created work, prohibiting copying or reproduction of the work without permission. And only the actual work itself is protected, not the ideas behind the work. So what's covered? There's a lot covered under here. There's literary works, which are literary compilations, such as articles and postings, news feeds, books, computer software, code, and hardware design. Dramatic works. Movies, videos, television, theater productions, performances, including choreography and scenery that's fixed in some permanent form, such as writing, including electronic. Musical works, musical compositions with or without words, including music embedded in a website or stored electronically. Artistic works, paintings, drawings, charts, maps, plans, photographs, sculptures, graphic user interfaces, and architecture. In addition to these works, copyright protection has also been extended to performances such as actors, musicians, dancers, singers. Sound recordings such as CDs, um, tapes, computer memory, and methods uh, for reproducing sounds. And communication signals such as radio, television, cable, and internet broadcasts. All of those are protected by copyright. So it's, it's interesting uh, to see how many things are covered by copyright. Now, as I say to you, that he who owns the copyright's job it is to maintain the copyright. So copyright belongs to the person who created the work or to the employer where the work was created as part of employment, unless there's an agreement otherwise. Now, this is an interesting one. In a lot of places, such as the college or the university or something like that, you look at these courses, for example, the copyright. Who owns the copyright on this class, for example? Okay, so this class is recorded. Who owns the copyright for it? Well, in some organizations, that copyright goes to the individual. In other organizations, it goes to the organization. 
In the case of the college, in our contract of employment, it clearly says that the college owns the copyright to the classes. In the university's case, the university, the professor owns the copyright. So this provides some interesting problems or challenges for organizations who may have people who are inventive by nature, okay? So let's assume that there was an art class going on by the college and the artist at the college produces a work of art that's worth millions of dollars. Who gets the money for it? And, you know, that the advantage for the institution is that it could be a great source of revenue. However, the disadvantage for the individual is, you know, it's their work and they only, the college got the benefit because they happen to work there. So all of these are presenting some interesting uh, cases uh, and problems for who owns the rights to the products that you produce at work. So one of the things that your contract of employment would, should state is if you're in an inventive type environment, you need to be aware or weary of who gets the copyright for the items that you produce. So once copyright has been created, its owner can assign or license it all or in part to someone else, including to a corporation. So oftentimes, like if you look at um, if you look at a lot of the uh, music that's being produced today, uh, what the artist will tend to do will be to move the copyright to a corporation. And the reason of that is that a corporation has an indefinite life, as we've seen, right? So this 50-year rule after the death wouldn't hold. So if the copyright is owned by the corporation, the copyright will be maintained literally forever or until the organization disappears. The owner of the copyright can assign it to someone else, but even then the author will continue to have moral rights to the work. So you can sell your copyright, but you still have what's called moral rights. And when we think about moral rights, um, there are really three moral rights, attribution, integrity, and association. And this allows an artist, author, or performer to demand that one, her name or pseudonym continue to be associated with the work as the author, the work not be distorted, mutilated, or otherwise changed in such a way to degrade it or bring harm to the reputation. Or three, the work not be associated with any products, causes, services, or institutions in a way that may be prejudicial to the author's reputation. Now, where has this happened? Well, if you go back to the Trump campaign and other political campaigns, you will find that several artists have complained. For example, Neil Young, a Canadian artist who lives in the United States, very well known. Uh, some of Neil Young's songs have been used in political advertising or political rallies, we'll call it political rallies, by the Trump Organization. And Neil Young has gone to that and asked them to stop using his songs in their political functions. And the reason is that he holds moral rights, as well as copyright rights, uh, moral rights to those songs, and that he can, under law, he can ask that they not play those songs. Again, it's his job to manage it, though. So copyright can be assigned by but moral rights are retained after the assignment. The moral right of association bars the use of work with a product, service, cause, or institution that is prejudicial to the reputation of the author or without the author's permission. So polit political parties, be warned. Here's an example of um, Sarah McLaughlin, for example, a Canadian artist again. Um, Sarah McLaughlin's song, I Will Remember You, uh, was used in a video uh, that related to the Columbine High School tragedy. And uh, a police force had used it to make a video for some reason or another. And what had happened is that she found out about it, and the video was being sold for $25 each. And she found out about it, and she asked that her song not be associated or not be on that video. 
So the, the tape was put together for firefighters training. Um, so the decision to sell the tape followed a court order to make it available to families of victims. Now, okay, so copyright, copyright is restrictive. We know that, okay? And what, from a user's point of view, if you wrote something or had a, a famous piece of artwork or something or another, people like to enjoy it. And sometimes people like to use it for study purposes and the like. And the question is, what does copyright do to prevent you from doing that? Or what, what can you do with a copyright item. So amendments to the Copyright Act broaden the fair dealing exception, expanding on the right to use copyrighted work under certain conditions. So we can, the general public can use copyrighted work under certain conditions. Education, satire, and parody are allowable fair dealing circumstances such uh, set out in the Copyright Act, as well as research, private study, news reporting, criticism, and review. So you can use copyright act, so copyright work, so for example, a quote from a book or whatever, for the purposes of education, satire, parody, and the like. There's no infringement on copyright if the copyrighted work is used for any of these purposes, provided the use also meets the fairness factors established by the court that take into account the purpose, the nature, the amount, the alternatives, and the effect of dealing with the work. In terms of infringement of copyright, infringing copyright includes situations where a person tries to obtain the benefit from the sale, reproduction, distribution, performance, broadcast, or other commercial use of work. So again, there has to be a benefit going to that person who's using it. Plagiarism, copying another's work and claiming it as your own, is also a violation of copyright. The moral rights of an author are infringed when someone else asserts authorship or the work is mutilated or modified in such a way that the reputation of the author is harmed. And this is a big challenge for a lot of authors or a lot of people who design things, I'll call it uh, uh, artistic works, okay? Let's assume that you take a picture of an artistic work, the Mona Lisa, say, for example, and you stretch it. You put it on and you stretch it in order to fit the page. In other words, you mutilate it. That would create some very serious problems for the author. I don't know if Leonardo is going to, Leonardo da Vinci is the author. I don't know he'll be uh, too quick to, uh, to come and sue you on it. But the fact of the matter is you want to preserve the, the, um, shape and it don't mutilate the work. Regardless of who owns a copyright, where moral rights have been infringed, the author can seek an injunction or compensation. Again, so this moral rights issue comes up. So that's copyright. That's the very first one that we're dealing with. Any any question on copyright? No. So, Okay, so the key thing that you want to take from copyright is copyright benefits the author, but it has to strike that balance between benefiting the author and making sure people can use it for uh, their purposes of whatever, you know, being able to read the work, being able to enjoy the work, being able to criticize the work, being able to report on the work, these sorts of things. Another very important component for intellectual property legislation is something called patent legislation. So patents are really um, a design, a, it is a protection of a design, okay? So I have a stapler here in front of me. And if I look at that stapler, that stapler has a mechanism and I can push down on it and push this little staple out and the staple binds the papers together. Now that is a patentable object. In other words, it has some form and function. And patentable items tend to have a form and function that is really the essence of what the patent is, is covering. 
So the Patent Act, the Trademarks Act, and the Integrated Circuitry Topography Act are all part of this patent type umbrella. And uh, it, it gives the rights to the inventor. The, the inventor has some degree of control over the product.
just this just this past year, Arctic Cat, which is an American manufacturer of snowmobiles. Anyway, Arctic Cat used a design for their snowmobiles that was patented by Bombardier. And in fact, Bombardier took them to court and they were awarded $3 million in damages over the patent infringement. But you think, well, $3 million is not a lot of money when you're talking to these huge corporations. But one of the other things that uh, was uh, in the patent infringement case or the award was that Arctic Cat was no longer allowed to sell those snowmobiles in Canada. And this obviously had big implications for them. And in November, they reached an agreement. So Arctic Cat snowmobiles were again available for sale in Canada, but it certainly did the job on Arctic Cat for a few months anyway. And uh, it created some serious challenges over, uh, over this. So every once in a while, you see examples of this type of situation happening out there in the marketplace. Okay, the next thing that I... <clears throat> that we looked at that also falls under patents is something called a trademark. Now, a trademark is really a symbol. <coughs> it's a symbol or a design. The symbol has a design to it or sound. So, for example, when you go to Netflix and that sound that Netflix makes, that's patented. The NBC uh, chimes, that's patented. Or a color. Certain colors are patented. McDonald's, the yellow, patented. So uh, what we got is really some distinctive feature or combination of distinctive features that, that sets it apart. Okay? So it can be a word, a design, a symbol, or a packaging. So the trademark identifies the source of the manufacturer of the goods rather than the product itself. Okay? It's very much a trademark is... Uh, like the Nike swoosh identifies Nike, the corporation, as opposed to the type of shoe. And once they're registered, uh, they're protected by the Trademarks Act. And that prevents people from taking the trademark and allows you to guard your trademark. Because realistically, companies, you know, we talk about in, in accounting, you talk about goodwill. Now, goodwill is a major asset for companies because what it does is it's really their brand name. Tim Hortons. They have a lot of goodwill tied up in the brand name. Uh, so they're going to do everything they can to protect the brand name. And the trademark really embodies that brand name. So applying for a trademark registration is a complicated process requiring services of an expert. And once registered, trademark must be used. Failure to do so could result in the loss of the trademark through abandonment. Also, whether the trademark, uh, also where, whenever the trademark appears, it should be marked with a R symbol. You see that little registered trademark. That's what that means. Um, or you can put a TM there if it's it's not yet registered. So trademarks can lose their status, and this is a this is a big concern for businesses. It, it, and again, it's one of these double-edged swords. Okay, aspirin, trampoline, Kleenex, linoleum have all lost their trademarks because they came into common use. But you know, you know, you've made it as a product when you become a verb. You Google right? Google has become a verb. Or you go on skidooing. You go skidooing. It's become a verb. And, you know, companies relish that in one breath because, wow, you, they're, they're so known in the industry that they are the top. And that's top of mind. Everybody is always saying your name. The challenge with it is, is once people start doing that, then your trademark comes into question and your logo and your brand could be compromised by the fact that everybody calls a snowmobile a skidoo or everybody calls a search engine a Google. So, you know, and, and we've got this situation happening right at this instant. So here's a story that was in the news yesterday and today and we'll be there for a little bit. It's kind of a neat little story. This company, Satan Shoes, <laughs> this company um, have, have gone out, MSCHF Product Studios, whatever they're called is the name of the company, but they've gone out and they've created Satan Shoes. So what they've done is they've gone out and got a bunch of Nike sneakers. I don't know what type of sneaker it is. They've gone out, they picked out these sneakers, 
and they've added one thing to them. They put a drop of blood in a little bubble in the shoe and attached to the shoe, and they sold them. In fact, they sold 666 pairs yesterday, and they were sold out in a matter of minutes. Anyway, they're, they're devil-themed shoes is what they're called. And uh, Nike is in the process of suing them now for trademark infringement. And you can read that story. Oops. Uh, that story. You can read that story if you click on that, that link there. So athletic shoemaker Nike on Monday sued New York-based company that produced Satan shoes re uh, purported to contain a drop of human blood as part of a collaboration with Old Town Road rapper Lil Ness X. I don't know who that is. But anyway, Nike said in a lawsuit, in the lawsuit, the company M. SCHF products infringed and diluted its trademark with the black and red devil themed shoes, which went on sale online on Monday. Lil N X is not named as a defendant in the suit. The shoes are customized Nike Air Max 97 sneakers that contain a red ink and one drop of human blood in the sole. According to the website described, the 666 pairs of limited edition shoes, uh, the black uh, the back one shoe says M-S-C-H-F, and the other says Little Nas X. Anyway, so Nike is in the process now of bringing them to court. So that's, that's you know, right now going on. And, you know, as I say, you see this stuff happening quite a bit in the news. Um, and uh, it, it's it's often fodder for uh, a lot of uh, legal legal uh, to and fro. Uh, 